good evening. I would like to reconvene the October 5th, 2021 meeting of the Davie County School Board. Uh, first, uh, before we get moving, I need to ask for a motion to modify the agenda. Uh, we've got a, a scheduling conflict, and so the United Way recognition will have to be removed. And then I also need to add a personnel action uh, right before committee uh, staff reports. I have a motion by Mr. Carroll. I have a second by Ms. Webb. All those in favor? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. <clears throat> so before we move into the uh, tonight's meeting uh, items, I, I want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. <clears throat> your, uh, your attendance and participation although sometimes is uh, uncomfortable, uh, is important to this board. It helps us guide us as we try to do what is best for all the children of this community. Uh, at the same time, we ask that uh, everyone be respectful uh, and, and honor the procedure of the board. There is a time to hear from you uh, on the agenda uh, during public comments, and we look forward to that time. Uh, there are copies of the agenda located at the entrance uh, if you care to have one. Again, thank you for being here. Our next item on the agenda is our invocation. Loving and gracious God, we thank you today for all your blessings, for the successful outcomes of our school events, and for all of our staff members. We ask that you bless them abundantly, and we seek and we continue to seek your wisdom guidance, courage, and strength. Be with us in our deliberations and help us to be wise in the decisions we make for the good of all of those who have placed their trust and confidence in us. Give us insight to lead with integrity, that our decisions may reflect what is right and good. Keep us from short-sightedness and pettiness. Help us to make decisions that are for the good of all and guard us from blind self-interest. Grant us the humility to always seek your will in all that we do and say. Amen. Uh, now, if you will join me uh, in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, next is the approval of the minutes. I'll ask a motion to approve the minutes from the September 7th meeting. I have a motion by Mr. Drexler. I have a second by Ms. Smith. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries 7-0. Next important dates, uh, we've got a couple. October 13th through the 15th is the school board uh, fall law conference in Asheville. Uh, and then October 15th, it's a Friday, is the Davie Experience. It's a district-wide professional development, Davie County Schools, schools employees. November 1st at 6 p.m., the Board of Commissioners meeting. And November 2nd, we are back in here uh, for our November meeting at 6 o'clock, uh, closed session at 5. And then we also have uh, November 11th through the 13th is the North Carolina School Board Association annual conference for those who are attending that. Next, I will call on Mr. Wallace for the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, board, staff, and guests. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. First state uh, or step of action would be to recognize Ms. Mavelle Nelson to my right. Ms. Nelson, welcome. Uh, we're glad you're here. And uh, Ms. Deanna has um, taken a position to be with her family or more with her, often with her family. She's told us a few times that she has Fridays off. So <laughs> she reminds us of that. But... Uh, Either way, she's taking a part-time position, but we want to, again, thank Ms. Nelson. She is uh, quite the background, in her, and, and she and her 
um, <clears throat> this point in her career has decided to work with children. She spent quite a bit of time working, I think maybe five years at William Ellis, somewhere in there close, and then working at their front office at central office, and then uh, applied and was definitely a qualified candidate for this position. So welcome. We're off to a good start. So thank you. Tonight's meeting and, and uh, all other board meetings are an opportunity to engage in a democratic process that is valuable to Davie County, North Carolina, and this country. We should never make light of this opportunity. Moreover, we should never disrespect the process or others. Parents, your input and partnership are vital in the education process, even when there are differences. Please know we want to hear from you, but we expect the privilege and interactions to be respectful as we work together for our children. As has been stated, thank you all for being here. Board, I want to thank you for your taking the time last Friday to, to be to participate in a retreat. And it's always um, interesting when I asked Dr. Coble. I said, Dr. Coble, I've done these personality trainings with you before. I said, do you typically post all of this on the wall? He said, mm, not usually. He said, but you got the right kind of board. You got a great board. He said, so the trust and relationship among your board, I knew that we could do that. So I said, well, I wasn't quite sure. But uh, again, thank you for your vulnerability. Thank you for being willing to talk and share. And uh, group, uh, staff and folks, I want you to know your board is continued to learn or interested in growing and building a stronger relationship with each other so we can better serve. And that was the whole point, just to become better and to better serve. Um, update on school nutrition. Uh, you all know that schools were closed and, uh, on March 13th, which was Friday, 2020. And on um, March, since March the 16th, 2020, through the beginning of this school year, through August 20, our school nutrition continued to operate under emergency feeding, and they have served 1.3, 1,393,577 meals, which is phenomenal. Probably one of the most efficient groups and pleasurable groups to be around. Over the summer, just in the summer, still in emergency feeding, they provided one, over 108,000 meals to families. So just a phenomenal, phenomenal job. And I commend Mr. Selecki and that team. We, uh, board, we have our first month of, of attendance rate. We have monthly attendance rates. And for the first month of school, it was 91.21%. 91.21%. And that's compared to the last two to three years, it has been 96%. Now, students that are quarantined are counted as absent. They're not there. Now, they can do their work, but it is an excused absence. But, you know, the school attendance laws are pretty strict. You have to physically be at school or on a school trip, something school-sponsored. But um, a little lower, of course, than we hope, but 91.21% for the first month. And hopefully, as we continue to get better, it's COVID, we can get a better handle on that and things to begin to settle that will it would not be improved. Um, on Thursday, uh, September 3rd, 23rd, excuse me, September 23rd, the Ashley Furniture team, part of their team, visited Davie County Schools. I want to commend Mr. Anthony Davis. He uh, led a group uh, led by Chris Gingler. Chris is the um, Education Foundation Manager, the Ashley Education Foundation Manager. And uh, he had two fine ladies with him that I understand. I wasn't able to join, but uh, Cherie Wagner and Katie Forsyth. And when I found out later that that's, both of those are Mr. Ron Wanick's daughters. So they were, um, they toured Davie County High School. They toured North Davie Middle School, taking a look at many of our career offerings, career technical, uh, career technical offerings. And they were particularly interested in the greenhouse, ag mechanics, he took a look at, at welding, our plasma cutter, and uh, the Pitsco lab, which is primarily a, a STEM lab. And the unique thing about the Pitsco lab is it incorporates reflection. You don't just go build bridges and tear them down and try to figure out what happened. You build them when you, or, when you design as an engineer, you reflect on your practice in the moment. So it was really neat. So uh, we're grateful again to have that group working with us. And um, we're very thankful for them. And again, thankful for Anthony to, uh, that's willing to wor work with that group. And the two principals, Mr. Uh, Pruitt and Mr. Copeland. K-Building update, uh, over the past few weeks, Mr. Spillman 
and the Fuller Architect team has met with each individual director and looked at their workspace that they need and it's laid, that's designed in the, in the plans that are being put together. Um, one specific area, as you well know, for K building will be the location, will house our virtual school and many of our student services staff. And then with the virtual school, obviously we're trying to take a look at what learning looks like in the future and making sure we can differentiate and serve our, our staff, our kids and staff as, as best we can. COVID has forced us to rethink how we deliver instruction. Therefore, Davie County Virtual School is one of the options that we've provided. We'll have a student community lab that will be open after hours where students can, and, and families can get help. We'll centralize some of our services that are scattered over two or three campuses, and uh, no doubt that this will have a direct impact on student learning. The focus is on student learning, forward thinking, and the learning loss that we've, we've talked about for quite some time. We, um, we're excited, to, again, to find ways to, um, to just improve learning and, and to keep moving. Uh, with the recent acts, sad acts and unfortunate acts of violence and weapons on school campuses, there's been much discussion around among superintendents and just about everyone in schools about safety and protecting our, our children and our staff. We, I've mentioned many times that we, your district leadership, we, have, we are in continuous communication about safety to make sure we're prepared, properly monitoring and conducting specific drills. Um, recently, Davie County Schools lead SRO met with an, met with an officer that, from the Winston-Salem Police Department that actually worked the Mount Tabor shooting. And they sat down and had time to talk about what went on and how, how could we improve and get better. So we follow up from that meeting uh, last week, um, Ms. Haynes, Mr. Harris, myself met with uh, lead SRO Jeff Jones, Sheriff uh, J.D. Hartman and Chief Deputy Brian um, <clears throat> Jacobs. And we discussed topics and we discussed what Jeff had learned in, some, in being prepared. We are planning a drill over Christmas while the bill would not have students there unless they want to participate but it'll be primarily an empty building. But there will be a, a, a serious or a large scale drill be conducted there with, uh, with the Sheriff's Department and our SROs and the EMS and some of those. Siri thinks I'm talking to her. Sorry, don't want her to say anything. So, all right. Um, but Jeff, we wanna thank you for sure and your, your part and involvement with that. So again, thankful for that relationship. COVID update, um, as of yesterday, uh, board, we shared with you that we have 29 students that are that active cases of 29 students and 10 staff members, quarantined 173 students and 10 staff members. Uh, this morning, uh, we were informed of a very positive change uh, with the quarantine protocol if you, re if you recall, and it's, again, and if you'll go to our website, you can see the updated one, but in a school setting, two fourth graders are properly masked, consistently properly masked, and one of those young men or young ladies, whatever, the fourth grader is, contracts COVID. Then the person within that six foot radius of them during the school day or in their, in their classroom does not have to quarantine. That's not changed. What has changed, it was announced this morning, so I'm the teacher of those fourth grade kids. Before today, I was properly masked, the fourth grader was properly masked, the fourth grader contracts COVID, I still had to go home. To, as of to, immediately tomorrow, same scenario, I'm fourth grade teacher, working with a fourth grade kid that contracts the virus, we're both properly masked, I do not have to go home. I do not have to quarantine. Now, it has been prior to that, it had been if I had been if I was vaccinated, I didn't have to anyway. But we have some of our staff that are not vaccinated. But if now, if both parties, now it just says individuals. And it doesn't say students anymore. It says individuals that are within proximity, the six foot radius, potentially was exposed, properly masked. You do not, neither one has to go home. Well, the COVID kid has to go home. Yes. Sorry. So, 
But that is a real positive change for us. And you're going to hear from uh, Ms. Haynes tonight in the HR report about the difficulties with staffing and finding, um, finding some substitutes. Uh, Eddie, do you mind pulling up a couple of slides? I want to show you two slides. Board, I presented this to you. I think I, I shared this with you today. If I have it, I will. But this will be on the, you can see this is from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. And it delineates out the three counties without mask mandates and their uh, average clusters per 100 schools. Now, that doesn't mean they had 17.2 clusters in every district. That's just the ratio that they use. And you can see the 89 counties, we speaks for itself, of those that, that were masked and the number of clusters that were in those schools per 100. I am somewhat reluctant to brag, but at the same time, I will tell you, we have not had a cluster in any of our schools. I'm very, very, we're very fortunate and very thankful for that. But again, this is from the Health and Human Services, and you see the time frame from August 26th through September 26th. Um, one other, if you'll take a look at the next slide, please. One of the studies, uh, Nick, go ahead, Nick. Nope. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Um, and again, you can see it for yourself there, but K-12 school mask policies and school outbreaks. The point there is the likelihood of outbreaks when schools that are not are making mask optional versus those that are requiring mask. Now we talk about using data, and I'm gonna make it loud and clear again, board. I'm not sitting here debating whether I agree with mask or not. I'm sharing with you what the data that is collected from the, from the not the high school association, the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services presented this information in a statewide meeting this morning. Also, as you recall in this meeting that I did send to you in a link today, I had to send a second one, there was an incorrect link, about COVID-19 in schools, legal authority and requirements documents. There had been some questions about Union County so deciding whether to follow the quarantine guidelines or not. And there's a lot of intricate stuff involved with that that we don't all know about. Uh, I did talk to a few, but my point is, um, there's some legal guidelines that was issued today about the quarantine protocol that we have to follow. So, all right. Um, recently, I met with the school reopening team that includes the county manager, a local physician, the director of DHHS, Suzanne Wright, <clears throat> and uh, Lori Dingler. Uh, and we are constantly monitoring and talking about the COVID situation. You can see in our county and across our state, there seems to be somewhat of a, a, a decline in the presentation this morning. DHHS talked about that, which is very positive. We, uh, but again, we continue to talk about What's next for us? Um, we also talked about meet, we, we, I will meet with that group once a month it, prior to each board meeting and to talk about what our next steps are. And, then, and again, we just get their advice, the professionals. And as you know, I also communicate with, continue to communicate with the ABC Science Collaborative. Every two to three weeks, we have a meeting. So if I can't attend, Ms. Nelson sits in. So we, um, one thing I, but we'll, I really want you to know that we continue to work with them in monitoring the situation. But I asked them today, I met with them again today, and I said, do you have a message that you want me to bring out to our board and our community? And in the word, just thank you. They all said, thank you very much. We don't like the situation we're in, but thank you. And they commended this board for making a tough decision and partnering with them and listening and being thankful for you. They know it's hard, but they wanted to tell you how much that they did appreciate you all. I just want to make sure that I shared that. All right. My next piece in my report, I'm going to step to the podium. So any questions about anything I've mentioned thus far? Are we on schedule with K-Building for the bidding process? We would, yes. Okay. We are on schedule with, with, with the meeting with the groups. We should have something, a tentative or a draft to look at, hopefully this week, Mr. Spillman. I got a thumbs up. From Mr. Spielman. So we uh, should be, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Jeff. Yes, ma'am. Um, back to your meeting this morning with the back to school yep. group. Um, 
I'm sure there was some conversation on where we are now and where we are going. Right. Um, I know they can't read the future, but did you get the impression that they feel like right now we're in a holding pattern, that they feel like, I mean, obviously, numbers going down, it looks like we are trending in the right direction. Right. So did you get any sense for what their opinion was on that? I, I did, uh, and, and to your point, I said, what can you tell me? And I said, well, Jeff, we can't, we're not sure. But what we can tell you is it is did trend down. Our current positivity rate was 11.1, 11.2. Both the doctor and Suzanne said, we expect that to trend up just a little bit this, this week. You know, that number's a lagging number because they have seen a little bit more activity, but they've not seen a spike. So they do feel good about where we're heading. And, and uh, they did mention that this seems to be what they had predicted with the Delta virus variant of the spike and then hopefully decline. The one thing that they, they did landmark is says we will be really curious to see what happens after Thanksgiving. You know, if you look at the month of November, we have, we have a, a, a work day, a, a holiday, two holidays. So it's broken up and so our kids will be with families more. So we'll be real curious to see, that's kind of a landmark. They wanna see what happens after that. Now it doesn't mean we won't, we're going to talk, you know, in, in through October. But, um, uh, of course, we want to see the positivity rate continue to come down. We are still a red county, um, for sure. And, I, matter of fact, I think all 100 counties are still red. Uh, and that's pretty much as far as they'd go. Yep. But we are discussing that, yes. Kind of as a follow-up to Wendy's, is there any, like, goal in sight? Or is there a metric or any kind of guideline that people could sort of look towards to see what we're... We're headed the right direction, yes, but I mean, I know we can't put a set date on it, right. but if there's something, I think people kind of knew there was an end goal in sight. Might make well, I, I don't know what that is. And, and again, that's, um, we, we talked about before setting a, setting a, okay, if we get to 5%, then we do away with the mask. Well, and I'm gonna go to the opposite side of that. If you recall last year after Christmas, we were seeing a spike in our county. There was, and we were red, but we still came back to school. And there were quite a few demands that we extend Christmas or stay virtual, but we didn't. So if we, and, and so it's a good, it's a fair question. We've got to know where we're going at some point. That's a fair question, Ms. Smith, I agree 100%. Um, but I think it, schools are, are what, the more data we're seeing, that schools are more of a unique setting if we do it the right way, um, so I don't know. I don't know what that is. I, again, I think it's a lower positivity rate for sure. Absolutely. But if you say five percent, then we could still have clusters in school. I'm just not sure yet. But it is a fair question and one that we continue to monitor and look at. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to step up to the microphone. Mr. Spillman, would you join me to the podium, please? Board and, and audience, I want to uh, have an opportunity here to recognize Mr. Michael Spillman, who failed to tell his supervisors something very special. Michael Spillman was recently honored as North Carolina Maintenance Association Maintenance Director of the Year for the entire state of North Carolina. So congratulations. <laughs> Mr. Spillman has a big anniversary coming up with Davie County Schools in November 1st, 1987, correct? Yes, Correct. He would at 34 years. I, I may have told this story. If I did, bear with me. It's worth repeating. When Michael, a year or two ago, was talking about moving toward his retirement, and I knew his wife, his beautiful wife's with him tonight, who is a retired educator, we were in a conversation, and someone asked the question, what's the temperature of the water that comes out of a hot water heater? And he just rattled it off like that, and I said, oh, my goodness. 
we've got to keep him for a long time. Who knows the water temperature that comes out of particular water heaters or dishwashers? And I said, we've got to keep Michael for a while. In 1987, Michael started in delivery and maintenance of school serve food services. In 1993, he transferred to a full-time maintenance position. In 2001, Mr. Spillman became the assistant maintenance director. And in March of 2013, Michael became the director of facilities. Michael's leadership and hard work has an absolute direct impact on every child in our school and every teacher. Uh, he, do, he knows so much. Now his challenge is to get someone ready. He keeps saying, I don't have anybody. I said, get someone ready. So now we've taken on the K building and the virtual school. I said, you cannot retire until that's done. So we've had good conversations and uh, Michael, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. Personally, I appreciate you. I've known you for a long time prior to our careers together. And um, I know what I'm gonna get from you. We know that you know what you're doing and it is an honor to see our Davie County Schools Maintenance Director be recognized on a state level as the State Maintenance Director of the Year. So I, we stole this from his office today. <laughs> We took, Ms. Nelson had a first task, and Ms. and Carol and uh, Michael's assistant, we were able to steal this out of his office. So be careful. Okay. okay? Michael, thank you, buddy. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it very it. much. I heard you clap. Thank you. Lose my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Congratulations, Mr. Spillman. You ready to be back up? Next, I will uh, call Mr. Wallace again for the uh, Government Finance Officers Association Certificate of Achievement. Mr. Harris, come on, please. I will remind everyone in the audience and board members and Mr. Harris while he's standing here. There's one person in this district that works at the will of the superintendent. Here he stands. So he does a great job. You're going to hear more about that from our audit report, but another recognition, we were notified, Clay and his team were notified by the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada that Davie County Schools Finance Department has been awarded a financial reporting achievement. Basically, he dotted all of his I's and crossed all of his T's and the numbers were right. Again, which you're going to hear more about later tonight. But Clay has a great team. We just added a new member, and he's taking on some more responsibilities as chief operations officer. But Clay, I want to tell you how important it is. You do a good job. And, like, and again, personally, you, 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 do, you do more than just numbers. And we appreciate that, and we're very proud of you and your team. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Mr. Harris. Next uh, item on our agenda is a consent agenda, and I will entertain a motion. I move have a motion by Mr. Carroll. I have a second. I have a second by Mr. Drexler. Any discussion, questions? All those in favor? Motion carries 7-0. Uh, next item is the added uh, personnel. Uh, prior, earlier, just earlier, we met as a board in uh, closed session to discuss our superintendent, uh, to review our superintendent. And, uh, and I will say it's uh, raving reviews. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things were said. Uh, some programs were uh, mentioned uh, through COVID. Um, Mr. Wallace joined our school system in that position uh, and was thrown right into the fire pretty quick uh, with, with, with what happened through COVID. Um, I got to see firsthand uh, what Mr. Wallace was made of. And uh, the one comment that I always say when someone asks me about him is, I've never seen someone um, so willing to run towards the fire instead of away from the fire. Um, willing to meet everything head on. Uh, so a lot of the words that, uh, that were said, um, just the partnership that you have with, uh, with the community, leadership, professionalism, uh, respect, communication, 
humility and the willingness to celebrate the team um, and, and to empower your team. Uh, I think all those characteristics uh, speak more about you as a person and just your management skill and your style uh, and just the way you carry yourself. Um, so I will entertain a motion. Or, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Junk. I'd be privileged to make that motion, and I would move that we extend Mr. Wallace's contract for one year to June the 30th, 2025. I would move that we increase his base salary by 7.13%. Uh, especially in light of last year, we were not able to give a salary increase. We'd like to increase this annual leave by six days, and all of which could be converted at a per diem rate in accordance with his contract, and then provide a contribution to his retirement uh, account for uh, the amount of $6,000. Do I have a motion? I think I'm that's sorry? Right. No, that was a that was that was a motion. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Do I have a second? I have a second by Miss Smith. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries seven zero. Thank you, sir, for your leadership. Uh, next staff committee reports. Um, we've got uh, annual audit, uh, Mr. Harris. Board, I, I want to take a minute to introduce uh, Andy Deal. He's with our uh, external auditing firm, uh, Anderson, Smith & White. Um, the recognition was for last year. He's for uh, 20, I'm sorry, 1920. He's going to talk about our 2021 audit that we just finished up, um, what, about a month or so ago, six weeks ago, something like that. So, Good evening. Hope everyone's doing well. Again, my name's Andy Deal. I'm a partner with the accounting firm Anderson, Smith & Wyke. Um, we're the auditors for Davie County Schools. Um, and yes, the year we're talking about tonight is the, the audit for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2021. So school year 2020-2021. Um, we'll start tonight on page one. On page one, we have our first auditor's report. Um, there are four auditor's reports in these financial statements. The first one here deals with the financial statements and whether they're in accordance with GAAP or generally accepted accounting principles. The next three audit reports uh, deal with compliance, and we'll talk about those later. Um, but the first audit report here is an unmodified report, which you could also call a clean report. Um, the reason we call it an unmodified report means we didn't note anything during our audit that would require us to modify our auditor's report. So that's why we refer to it as an unmodified report, and it's the cleanest report you can give. It's the highest level of assurance we can give on a set of financial statements. Uh, next, if you'll flip over to page 14. On page 14, this is the, um, the balance sheet for the governmental funds. So it's going to be all the funds for the school district except for the child nutrition fund. The child nutrition fund um, has different accounting rules. It's, uh, the accounting rules for the child nutrition fund are more like a for-profit business. Therefore, their statements are on a, in a different part of this report here. Um, but if you look at this here, this is our balance sheet for your governmental funds. This is going to give you a snapshot of the financial condition of the school district as of June 30th, 2021. So it's going to show you what your cash balance is as of June 30th. It's going to show you what your accounts payable balance is, what your ending fund balance is. So it's a very important part of these financial statements. Um, one number I want to highlight, if you look at the first column, that's the general fund. If you look at the second number from the bottom, that is the total fund balance. So as of June 30th, 2021, uh, the general fund had a fund balance of just over $4 million. If you'll flip to the next page, page 15, this is the statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance for the governmental funds. 
Um, you could also call this a profit and loss statement or an income statement. But this is going to have all of your revenues and expenses um, for all of your governmental funds. And um, if you look at the first column, that's the general fund. If you look at the third number from the bottom, that's going to tell you your net income for the general fund for the year. And uh, for the year ended June 30th, 2020, the general fund had a net increase in fund balance of just under $1.3 million. So fund balance increased just shy of $1.3 million with an ending fund balance of $4 million. And then another number I want to highlight on this page, um, your ending fund balance is $4 million. That may seem like a lot, but one thing I want to point out, your general fund fund balance is pretty much your financial reserves. Um, if you get in any kind of financial bind, it's going to be the general fund that kind of kicks in to, to, to pay it. Um, if you look at the second column, the state public school fund, if you look at the third number from the top, your total revenues for the state public school fund are about $40 million. So if you had a 3% cut in your state revenues, that would be $1.2 million. So and that's just a 3% cut on your state revenues. That's not counting federal revenues, county revenues. So you can see that if there's any cuts or anything in the future, you could chew through $4 million really quickly. Just wanted to point that out. Um, another thing I want to uh, look at is on page 23. On page 23, this is the statement of cash flows for the school food service fund or the child nutrition fund. Um, as I mentioned before, the accounting rules for your child nutrition fund are more for a uh, for-profit business. They're more similar to like a for-profit business. And due to that, they have to record uh, long-term liabilities like for the pension plan, the retirement health plan. And I'll be honest, it, it really muddies the water on, okay, how well did the child nutrition program do financially because you have all these non-cash liabilities that they have to record where, you know, they're not writing checks for these items. Um, it's just the actuary says this is what the liability is and they divvy it up amongst all the school districts. Um, so one thing I like to look at to see, okay, how well did the child nutrition program do is the statement of cash flows. It's basically, just like it sounds, it's gonna give you the change in cash for the year. Um, if you look at the third number from the bottom, the net change in cash for the child nutrition fund was $680,000 uh, increase. Th that is a, uh, a strong financial performance for the district. Um, and, and it got better in 2021 with, with the, uh, the COVID feeding initiatives as far as school nutrition programs making cash. But across the state, child nutrition programs are struggling to make cash. So the fact that they made that much cash is a, um, is, is a good sign. And, and I think, you know, what causes it is just, uh, you know, years and years of trying to cut your costs, cut your costs because it's been so tight financially. And then you get this, you know, rush of stimulus funding and COVID feeding initiatives and, and their reimbursements go up. And this is what happens. But just compared to other school districts your size, that is a, a strong, strong number. So that, that's uh, honestly uh, good to see because we, we don't see that much. A lot, of, a lot of times what we see is child nutrition is losing cash and then the general fund has to bail them out. So um, no, that's, that's a good sign there. Um, next, if you'll turn to page 63. On page 63, this is where the compliance portion of the audit begins. Um, there are three auditor's reports in the compliance section. This is the first one. Um, this report is on the district's compliance with internal control over financial reporting and internal control over compliance. And again, this is an unmodified report. All three reports are unmodified, which again is the cleanest report you can get. Um, so that, that is definitely good news. Um, next, if you flip over to page 65, this is our auditor's report on the district's compliance with the major federal programs. And again, this is an unmodified report. And if you flip over to page 67, 
Um, this is our auditor's report on the district's compliance with the major state programs. And again, it's an unmodified report or a clean report. Um, we didn't have any audit findings or anything like that. So, you know, no news is good news there. Um, the next thing I want to go over is, does everybody have this retirement contributions for the past seven years? Um, we were talking about fund balance um, earlier and, and how you could chew through, you know, fund balance pretty quickly. Um, this simple chart here really drills that in. What, what this is, is you have your, your pension contribution that the district makes for the past seven years, the post-employment health care contribution that the district has made for the past seven years, and then the, the average covered employees for the past seven years. So you can see from 2015 to 2021, our average employees went from 855 in 2015 down to 759 in 2021, and our retirement costs went from 5 million to 7.4 million. So a decrease in, in, in employees, and the costs just keep going up and up and up. And, you know, I don't, I don't see that trend stopping in, in the near term. Um, I believe they've increased the retirement rate again for next year. Uh, and if they haven't officially approved it, I think that's what everybody thinks they're going to approve. Um, so one thing to keep in mind here, too, the, the school district has no control over these retirement contributions. Raleigh says, okay, per employee, all the school districts gonna, are going to chip in, you know, 25% per employee, 25% of their wages to these plans. Um, and another thing I want to highlight, this is retirement health care. This isn't current health care. This is just health care they get when they retire. Um, so the district has no control in, you know, setting these rates and these costs. You know, Raleigh sets the rate and you guys just have to pay it. So if Raleigh increases your rate, which they have for the past seven years at least, um, when Raleigh increases your rate, that doesn't mean the federal government goes, oh, the state of North Carolina increased their retirement rates. We've got to give Davie County Schools more money. That's not how it works. That, that doesn't mean the county of Davie is going to give you more money because Raleigh increased these rates. So this makes it really, really hard for districts to um, – grow and maintain fund balance. Um, and another thing too, it's the same thing with, with uh, state mandated raises. If the state mandates a raise, that doesn't mean the federal government is gonna give you more money to pay that raise. You know, you, you, you may get more money, but not due to that reason, but you may get less money. And then also, a lot of your state allotments are dollar allotments, meaning they're not, some of them are position, meaning they're going to pay you for a number of positions. But a lot of them are, you know, we're just going to give you a set amount of money, and they don't always increase that when they increase these rates. So this is something that can really put a strain on fund balance at school districts. Um, and and I, the reason I like to bring it up is, yeah, um, you know, fund balance, your fund balance may be good right now, but it's, it's easy to chew through it. And, um, you know, where we're at right now is very similar to where we were probably eight, nine years ago with the, um, with the ARA funding. To me, school districts that were smart, they, they used their ARA funds wisely to kind of maintain and, and grow their fund balance because after the ARA funds ran out, uh, education funds were just cut, cut, cut. So if you didn't have that fund balance, I mean, all you could really do was lay off employees. Um, so, you know, th this, this schedule really helps drill that in. And um, it's just it's a very simple schedule that I like to go over with the boards just to kind of, um, you know, help folks realize, you know, just keep in mind, you know, if, if you get a small cut, it, it can really hurt you. And, um, you know, like I said, this, this schedule helps show that. Um, but that's, uh, oh yeah, one more thing I want to go over tonight. Um, due to auditing standards, if we have difficulties in completing our audit, we are required to share those difficulties with you, the board. It, it is an audit standard. Um, we are pleased to report we had no difficulties in completing our audit. When we do an audit, we ask for a ton of documentation. We ask a lot of questions. And at, at Davie County Schools, 
you know, if we asked for documentation, we got it timely. If we asked a question, we didn't get a vague response that, you know, left us asking more questions. And that just allows us to do a much more effective audit. So um, I always like to go over that with, with the board. But um, that's all I have to go over tonight. If anybody has any specific questions, um, let me know. Yeah, do you know what the current federal reimbursement rate for free and reduced lunch and breakfast it used to be based on a single plate that was served. Does that still operate the same way? Is that one of the ways that we've kept our child nutrition in the in the black? Um, I don't know exactly how the rate is calculated, and I know with the COVID, it was. I think everybody got the free rate, um, but I, I think what it is is. I'll be honest, um, your child nutrition program financially, historically has performed good, you know, over the years, es especially if you compare it to other school districts this small, they just seem to have a real hard time of, of not losing money. And um, I think what it is, is it's, it's kind of sound financial management. Um, before the COVID feeding initiatives, there was, you know, it was harder to make cash. So I think, you know, they were doing stuff to make sure they weren't going to, you know, go into the red. And then, um, like I said, you, you have the free, redu uh, the free reimbursement rate that they got for the COVID meal. So that helped. And I think it was just, you know, you, you're so lean on your costs for several years and then you get, you know, stimulus money and COVID, COVID feeding initiatives. And it's kind of a perfect storm of, of you know, the increase in cash. Yeah. Please let me compliment you. That's probably one of the clearest uh, detailed presentations on the audit I've, I've had the pleasure of experiencing. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Next, I will call on Ms. Haynes for HR update. Good evening, Chairman Junker, board members, staff, and guests. Um, I am here tonight to share with you a, an update on human resources, and actually I feel like he, he paved the way and touched on some things that, that I will touch on as well. Um, I also will say up front, certainly stop me if you have questions as we go through, or I'll entertain questions at the end. I, I may not have all the answers, um, but if not, we'll, we'll figure them out, or I'll, I'll go back and look up some information if, if you want more information. I also would say to Mr. Harris, um, because HR and finance are so closely tied that I may turn to him if there's a question related to money, um, or Mr. Wallace, who was in HR before me. So certainly jump in as needed. Um, as we start this, I want to give you just an overview to begin with. Um, just as a reminder, in case you don't remember, as far as staff overview is concerned, we typically have about 800 permanent employees. So about 500 certified and about 300 that are classified. Let me figure out the best way to click my slides here. That makes us the second largest employer in Davie County Schools behind Ashley Furniture. Just to give you kind of overview and an idea of where we stand. Keep in mind, if we run a report on any given day, depending on who has resigned, who's coming in, those numbers may fluctuate just a little bit, but this is, this is basically where we hover. What that means is that personnel represent somewhere between 84 and 87 percent of our total budget, depending upon um, funding for a given year, depending on grants that we may have written, um, depending on you know federal funds, Title I, how many positions we're paying for with Title I money. Um, so lots of different things, but that's kind of the ballpark, just to give you an overview as we talk about this, because again, closely tied to the funding situation. So. Again, this is very related to the audit report, and I didn't realize I was going to have that nice um, 
preface to this. So if you look at the cost of a first year teacher, and we want to compare that in 2008 versus 2021, where we are right now. First of all, I want to make sure to highlight that the numbers that you see in orange are not take home pay. This is not what a first year teacher makes because that looks a lot better than what it really is. Um, that is the total cost of a first year teacher. So that is their salary, that is their retirement, which right now is 21.68%, their health care plan, and FICA. That's total package or cost of an employee. So if you look at that in 2008 versus 2021, you see the significant change. And again, you've seen that on the other handout that he gave you tonight. So ultimately what that means is when our, the increase in cost of an employee outpaces the increase in funding, we experience a reduction in employees. Again, I didn't know that he was going to provide that handout for you tonight, but you see that. You know that we've had to make reductions over the years. In 2008, a million dollars would employ about 26 teachers. Today, that same amount of money will, will pay for less than 20 teachers. So that's what we see over time. So even though our ADM may have decreased slightly, our staff has decreased at a, at a much more significant rate, so not proportionately. Let's go ahead and jump forward. Because he talked about projections and what we think is coming. And this is Mr. Harris's job. So again, I'm going to refer you to him if you have questions about this. It is his job to try to forecast and help you guys as far as figuring out budget for the next year. So as he forecasts cost for the 2022 fiscal year, this is what he's looking at. So if you see the, the teacher to the far right or the silhouette of a teacher to the far right, you'll see with no salary increase, we're still talking about an increase in cost for each individual employee. And again, this is a first year teacher. Then you see below that the increase in cost with a 4% increase in salary. So the first number is just based on an increase in the cost of benefits in the retirement going up, which is out of our control, and the health care plan going up, which is out of our control. Okay, again, I had such a great intro tonight, so thank you to the auditor. This gives you a little more detail as far as the personnel cost. So if you take a look at that retirement over over time, from 2008 to 2014 to 2021, you see that climb right there. Um, we are now predicting that that retirement will be 22.88%. That's what's proposed. So again, continuing to go up. And here's your health care as you compare that from 2008 to 2014 to 2021. That is projected to increase $720 per employee this year. So that's going to go from that $6,326 to $7,046 per employee. The other note on here is our challenge about minimum wage. And this is specifically related to some of our classified staff who are hourly employees. We're going to talk about this some more as we go through some other slides. Um, our classified employee salaries need to be addressed. We absolutely acknowledge that. Um, but as Mr. Harris is trying to project and as we're trying to budget, we have to look at what the state's talking about when they're talking about a $13 minimum wage or a $15 minimum wage and figuring out how are we going to pay for that. Because again, sometimes those are not positions, those are dollars that we're paying for out of local, local funds. And again, if you two need to interject anything, you're certainly welcome. All right, so I'm going to jump a little more into the HR side of things and give you a little bit of hiring overview. Um, each year in March, we send intent forms out to all of our employees because it helps us plan. It helps us know, are you planning to be back with us the following school year or not? It also prompts some employees who might, they may have already made a decision or they may be thinking about making a decision as to um, not returning the next year. They may have already decided they're going to retire, but they haven't told us yet. So we send those intent forms out in March, and again, that helps kind of prompt that so that we can begin planning for the following year. Traditionally, we would not start posting positions any earlier than May 1st. Um, and, and typically, we would complete all of our hiring by sometime in July before students are returning in August. Um, however, I have to say with COVID, um, HR has changed significantly. In addition, 
We are seeing, you've heard about previously, even prior to COVID, the teacher shortage. Um, but again, the unpredictability of COVID is making a significant impact. So with that, we started posting positions as early as April this year, trying to get ahead of the game. At the same time, being very cautious not to overstaff um, and not knowing exactly what our student numbers would look like returning um, and opening, opening school back up with COVID. Um, but it has been a record-breaking summer. We're going to take a look at that. Um, obviously, it, it takes a lot of extra work from school level as well as district level. There are lots of folks involved in the hiring process. Um, we're processing resignations and retirements and those sorts of things, but we're also screening and we're interviewing and processing paperwork and onboarding. So there's just a lot of work that's behind the scenes when we talk about this timeline. I started tallying up some information. If you took the time to review the personnel report since intent forms were collected in March, we started posting positions in April to where we are today, October 6th, I think is what it is, so beginning of October. I want you to take a moment to let these numbers sink in considering the size of our staff and the numbers I presented on the first slide. 72 resignations, 25 retirements for the entire year. So some of those started actually prior to April. We hired 128 permanent employees. We reassigned or transferred 56. Keep in mind, a lot of times that is not someone um, who, who we just have reorganized and moved, but it's someone who has applied for, an, for a position and still gone through the interview process. So in that reassignment number, this is not, I teach fourth grade this year and next year I'm teaching fifth grade. This is I'm moving to another school, I'm moving to another position, I might be moving from a teacher to a media coordinator, but this is a real, what I call a real transfer, not just a change of grade level or what subject I'm teaching, okay? So this obviously creates a lot of domino effect. When one person is reassigned or transferred, that creates a domino and opens up another spot to hire. We also hired 44 interim, temporary, or substitute positions. But I want you to see that these numbers are tremendous. Um, I dare say, Mr. Wallace, this is a record, a record year. Um, again, it adds tremendous workload to all of our staff involved, um, not only from the HR standpoint, but for our staff who are in schools. When we have this many new people, we have this many changes, we have this many transfers and people in new positions, it means we have folks who need to be mentored, that are learning how to work together, that are, that are being onboarded. Um, so there's, there's a lot behind that. Now, when you look at these numbers, you might jump to the conclusion that we've added a lot of positions because it looks like we hired a lot more than we lost. So I do want to address that because that's really not the case. Um, that would be overly simplified math. We do have just a few grant-funded positions that are new. Um, but I will say last year, in some situations, we were not fully staffed. Um, so that's part of the thing. When we were on a plan B, um, we were not fully staffed with bus drivers because we weren't running full routes every day. We weren't fully staffed with custodians in some cases. So there's some situations where we weren't fully staffed. We weren't as, we weren't as, as staffed in even school nutrition. Um, so not having some positions that we could, that we could fill. In some situations, we've also had to become creative, and I'm going to talk about that at the end of this presentation. In some cases, we've had to hire two part-time permanent people to fill one permanent position. Um, so again, it's not a matter of increasing position, but it's about being creative in our hiring to cover bases. Do you have questions about this slide before I move on? How many substitutes would you really need if we were going to be in good shape? We're going to get to that because oh, I've okay. got some All slides right. on that. So great question. So hang on, I've got, some, I've got some good information for that, actually. All right, so one of the things that we want to look, about it, look at as we're talking about all of this hiring that we've been doing is the teacher attrition. And we do, an, we do a teacher attrition report. We work with the state on that each year. Um, so let me just kind of give you a little bit of overview, and then I'll dig a little bit deeper into the data. So we generally have somewhere between 420 and 425 teachers. And so you see kind of funnel down when we get through all of that, all of that process with intent forms and we lose some folks to retirement, to transfers. And when I say transfers, in this case, I'm talking about transferring out of the district somewhere else to teach, um, maybe family obligations or other reasons. We lose about 35 per year. Um, 
Each year, though, when we report that attrition rate, this is a little bit of a lagging indicator, but it's typically about 9%. So when we are looking at this, we're looking at it from March of one year to March of the next year. So we'll, we'll take a closer look so that you can see what some of that data looks like. So here is our retirement, our retirements for actually over the last several years. And you see that in 2021, again, I said we had 25. So if we look at that trend overall, it doesn't, I mean, it's not the highest retirement rate that we've ever seen. We see, we see a slight increase since 2020, but not a, not a huge number. Um, I was really a little bit surprised when we looked at this information. Here's what I think is, is maybe um, more telling. In, a, in typical times, in a traditional situation, a teacher or anyone really working for a school system is going to work the school year. So you're going to retire at the end of the school year, you're going to finish in June, and we're going to replace that person and have someone new that starts in August. What we've seen with retirements is that retirements are happening at unusual times. We've had folks who've retired a week or two weeks into the school year, a month or two months into the school year, a month or two months before the school year ends with just a little bit of time left or mid-year. Sometimes a very late retirement, late in the summer, like a last minute decision. So it's not so much that we have felt a huge increase in retirements, and this is really all retirements, not just teachers, um, but we're seeing non-traditional timing. When can I go out? When is the soonest I can go out in some cases? Um, and I think some of that really has to do with the challenges of COVID and the stress that people, that people are living through this time. All right, so let's talk about transfers and the attrition with that. So again, I said we start with 400, 420 to 25 teachers per year. We lose about 35. About a third of those each year are transferring to other districts. So since I've been in HR, I've really been trying to track this and look at where are people going. So in 2019-20, of the folks who left Davie County Schools continued to teach, but left to teach somewhere else, 80% of them transferred to a neighboring district with a higher teacher supplement. In 2020-21, 89% of those who left us to, and continued to teach but taught somewhere else transferred to a neighboring district with a higher teacher supplement. I don't know what our 2021-22 data is going to look like yet because this will be measured from March of 2021, who's on our payroll then, versus who's on our payroll in March of 2022. But I can already estimate it's going to look worse because I know what your personnel reports are looking like, and I know where people are going. So it's important that we take a look at our teacher supplements. Um, as, as you all know, we've been talking, we've been talking with commissioners. Commissioners are, are supportive in this. Um, we need to look at our teacher supplements. We have been at 5.5% since 2006, 2007. That's when it increased. Um, our staff, our teachers get a third of that in November and two-thirds of that in June. But if you look at the lineup, and Rowan County is not included on this because they have a flat rate instead of percent, so it's very difficult to compare. Um, but Clay can also tell you that it's still in comparison. Um, you see where we fall. Now, Winston-Salem for Scythe County, just, they have increased theirs recently, and I do want to explain what that number looks like because it looks funny. You see 7.2 plus to 15.4 plus. So when you pull out their supplement scales, what you'll see is the lowest teacher supplement is 7.2% plus $200 a month. So that's why, it look, that's why this looks that way. Um, Iredell increased theirs recently and moved up to 6.75, but you will see of, of our region, of our area, we are tied with Yadkin at the bottom at 5.5%. If we talk about classified supplements, there are some districts that have classified supplements, but this really varies from place to place. In some cases, it's a percentage. In some cases, it's a flat rate. Um, and in some cases, districts don't have a classified supplement just like Davy. But again, we're going to talk about classified a little bit more as we look at our vacancy ratings. Okay, so this leads us to our recruiting challenges. 
You've heard, I'm sure you've seen on the news, it's no secret, we have seen sharp declines across the nation in College of Education, um, the preparation programs. Most reports will tell you that they're seeing a decline of about one third, but you'll find different states and different places anywhere from 25% to over 50%, just depending on the, on the state or the region. Um, I can say, and with a, a fellow ADK member in the room, um, we tried to give away an ADK scholarship last year and we had zero applicants at Davie High School who applied for that scholarship to go on to be a teacher. That's heartbreaking, y'all. I, I just have to say that's heartbreaking. Um, there are lots of things that have made the field unattractive over the last 10 years and it's really hard to turn that around and to turn it around fast. So let's take a look at our day one vacancies. This is again another report that we work with the state. So we look at how many vacancies we have on the first day of students and the 40th day with students. So you will see over on the right hand side of the screen um, the caption educators absent. So these are the vacancies that we had on the very first day of school. We had four positions in elementary that were unfilled. Middle school we had one six nine math. At the high school level, we had five in a variety of subject areas, and then we had six EC that were in a variety of grade spans and areas. So that totals 16 vacancies, and you might ask why? Well, lots of reasons. Um, of course, we can talk about some of the, the previous conversation where it's you know supplement and COVID stress and all of those sorts of things, but when we look at the vacancies and, and, and why we ended up here on day one, part of it is you know, late summer enrollments when students were continuing to enroll late and we had to go into the full implementation of our K-3 class size this year. So that means very strict class sizes and no leniency in that. Um, so that meant that we had to add some positions or we had to post some pos elementary positions at the last minute as those numbers continued to climb. Um, we also had some delayed resignations and of course like everybody across the state we had some very hard to fill areas or some shortages. So when we look at those especially EC you'll see EC is our hardest to fill. There are not enough people out there to fill those spots. Math is our second so anything STEM field but math is typically even a little bit harder than science. But again, even this year, when we're talking about late hiring, we're struggling to get K-5 applicants when it's late. That's why we were trying to start so early in April. Now, you may want to know where we are now. Um, current certified vacancies are about 10. We will look at this count again on our 40th day, and that's when we'll complete our official report with the state. And I anticipate that will improve. Um, but it's going to improve in lots of different ways. And again, some of that's going to go back to creative hiring. Some of that's going back to some of these, some of the folks have been, have been um, hired. They've been on your board packet and you've approved them, but they're in a 30 day hold somewhere else. So we're waiting for them to get here. So again, you'll see some, some more of these disappear and you'll see that vacancy number decline as we hit day 40. Questions before I go on from there? Feel the need to pause because I'm racing. Okay. So let's take a look at our classified vacancies. This is not something that we actually report or have to do any kind of um, data analysis with the state, but I think it's pretty important. Again, something that you're seeing nationwide um, is an issue with not having enough bus drivers. And so you see them kind of at the top of our list. When Mr. Wallace looked at my slides, he said, I like your we're, hi we're hiring sign. And I said, where have you not seen one? Where have, well, what business, what restaurant have you been in that you have not seen a we're hiring sign? They'll interview you on the spot. Um, so that, that's our greatest challenge. And I would say hiring classified staff has been our greatest challenge. Um, we really, and we know this, we need to look at our classified salaries. They, they need attention to be competitive with the market. We don't have the flexibility to offer the signing bonuses and the incentives um, that even fast food restaurants have posted on their signs. So it is, it's a real struggle. And as I mentioned before, our classified staff does not receive a local supplement. At the same time, I will say, I will preach from the rooftop, these are essential jobs. Our schools cannot operate without these folks. We have to have bus drivers bringing kids to school and taking them home. We have to have the assistance of our, our teacher assistants, our instructional assistants, our custodians, our school nutrition. Um, even, and I know you've heard Jeff talk about this before, we had a mechanic position that we've had for months has, offered, has been offered at least three times and declined because of salary. 
So we have a, ma a maintenance and a transportation position that it's taken us months to try to fill. So this is a huge challenge. And again, I'll, I'll preach that one. All right, so Mr. Potts, substitutes. We've done some analysis of where we are with substitutes. So this line graph shows over the last four years the number of active substitutes that we have. And when you look at this, you, you see that big decline from 2020 to 2021. And obviously, a lot of that had to do with COVID. Uh, many of our retirees are, or many of our substitutes are retirees. Um, we had folks that called us and said, I'm not comfortable being in the school. You know, they might be in an age category, might have an underlying health condition, whatever, but not comfortable doing that, at least um, earlier on. So that has, that's been a struggle. I will also say, as we had to pivot and move to blended and hybrid learning and introducing Canvas and Seesaw, our substitutes didn't have time to pivot with us to get training and to really be able to be effective with that. So that's, that's been a little bit of a struggle as well. But when you look at that overall, if you look at where we started in 2018 on this graph, we had 106 and we have 98 now. So that doesn't look, that doesn't look like a huge issue. Um, the problem is our need for substitutes has increased so much, and it, it's because of quarantines, and it's because of, of the things that we're dealing with. So that's going to take us to our next slide. This is the one that really gets to me, and this is what we're hearing from staff across the county. So this graph shows us the substitute fill rate. We use a system that's called SubFinder. So our teachers, our staff call in, and they... they they put their job, so to speak, in SubFinder, and then our substitutes pick up those jobs. They accept those substitute positions. So we can run a report from SubFinder and look at the, our, our fill rate, how many of those positions were filled. Now, keep in mind, if we, if we have positions that aren't filled, that's when the principal or the bookkeeper is on the phone making personal calls to try to get those positions filled at the last minute. But if they can't be filled, what do we do? We stretch. We pull teachers during planning times. We have administrators that are covering. We pull from all different directions because we can't leave students in classrooms unsupervised and not learning. So when you look at these fill rates, 2017 through 2020, before COVID hit, you will see that our fill rate from SubFinder was 90% off the get-go. So we have 10% to try to make phone calls and try to cover in some shape or fashion. Not too bad. 2020-21, that fill rate dropped to 77%. Where we are right now in 21-22, our fill rate is 60%. 40% of our substitute positions, our substitute jobs, are not filled, are not picked up. So, as you can imagine, this is adding tremendous burden and stress to our staff. So, when people say, well, I don't understand why teachers are so overwhelmed, this is one big reason, one really big reason. Um, I reached out to our school bookkeepers because I wanted to go further than what I could run from a report. I wanted to know how many subs are you short on a given day, on average, in the month of September? Again, just back in school. Every school is trying to manage it, and it, again, it's different at different places, but most schools are short somewhere between one and three subs per day that they're covering for, one to three completely short. Davy High is running short on average six teachers a day, and it's been as high as 10. So again, kind of let that sink in. Um, stretched is the word. I'm not sure how else to say it. Does that answer your questions, Mr. Potts? <laughs> All right. So substitutes are related to COVID leave. So I wanted to put this slide in here. It's really difficult for us to measure the cost of COVID leave but I wanted to give you something to look at. Um, as, you, as you are already aware, when COVID hit, the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, which we typically call FFCRA for short, um, mandated up to two weeks of leave that's related to COVID. And this originally ran up to April 1st of 2021. Then there was an update and an option for us to extend that and even to reset it, and it ran through the last day of September, so just recently. Um, so this shows us the cost of FFCRA leave. That, that's what's showing to you in the teal bar. In addition to that, we have 
access to what's called contagious disease leave, and this has to be approved by the director of DHHS. Um, this is a policy that was created long before COVID. Um, I'm sure that the writers of that policy had no idea that COVID was coming, um, but you'll, you'll see that layered on top. And that policy just says that if someone is considered contagious, we can tell them to stay home and, and we, have, we still have to pay them, but we can tell them to stay home so that we do not continue to spread a contagious disease. Keep in mind, and, and Clay certainly jump in, a lot of this cost ends up hitting our pocketbook even locally. Um, when, we have a, when we have a mandate like FFCRA, this was a federal mandate, there weren't specific dollars attached to this that said, here's your pot of money for your substitutes. So generally speaking, when someone uses COVID leave, it is free to them, it is not free to Davie County Schools. And so they will continue to be paid out of their typical code, but we may be paying, we may be paying substitute costs on top of that. It may be actually increasing our costs in lots of different ways. Um, but again, you can see even, even comparing, you know, a month or two into the school year, we're already seeing significant numbers there. Um, also want to say that this graph doesn't tell the whole story. This doesn't tell us the cost of substitutes. This is the cost of what was paid to employees who were not able to work. So it doesn't tell you the additional cost of substitutes. Um, it doesn't tell you if we had staff who were, who were able to work remotely. If we had teachers who were on a Google Meet teaching from the front of their classroom but on a smart board, okay? Um, it also doesn't tell you when we had those substitute jobs that weren't covered. So again, there's lots of other costs there. So that means teachers and teacher assistants and counselors and administrators and every staff that we can pull from are stretched to make sure that, that students are supervised and continuing to learn. So the cost is not just in dollars. Okay. All right, so I have been like complete Debbie Downer. Like all of the, all of the challenges, I don't want to end there. So I want to, I want to add to sharing all of this data I want to add some, some positives and, and what you see that we're, hopefully, that we're doing. Um, I don't want to leave you on that note. We have many, many employees going the extra mile, many employees going the extra mile at all levels, at the school level, in departments, um, at central office, just doing extraordinary things to keep things running. So let's talk about some things that we're doing to overcome the challenges that we're facing as far as human resources are concerned. This slide is pretty power packed. I tried to pack a lot into it. So as I've said many times, um, unprecedented is not a word that we ever wanna use after COVID, but unprecedented times call for unprecedented measures. So we have been and will continue to go the extra mile in what we're doing because we know that recruiting the highest quality staff is really what makes this district um, as strong as it is. So let's talk about some of these. I'm gonna kind of start on the left-hand side and work my way around. Um, one of the things that we've done is we've participated in virtual job fairs. Um, when COVID hit, all of our face-to-face -face job fairs shut down. We didn't have access to colleges and universities and couldn't do that. So we also had to pivot. You'll see to the far left, we've had to create um, a, like a virtual job fair booth. Um, we have Zoomed. We've Zoomed with groups. We've Zoomed with one-on-one um, -on -one interviews, one-on-one -on -one appointments. I will say that as a small district, we are really disadvantaged in virtual job fairs because we might not have the name recognition that a Winston-Salem Forsyth, a Durham, a Wake, a Charlotte Mech has. Um, people say, Davy County who? Davy County where? Um, so it is much more advantageous for us to be in a face-to-face -face fair, to be able to make eye contact and say, good morning, can I talk with you about Davy County Schools? Um, that's how you reel people in. So shifting to virtual job fairs has been a challenge, but we have, we have done that. One advantage that it has had, though, is that we have been able to participate in fairs that were too far or too expensive to participate in. So it's really hard to go to UNC Wilmington, but they've got a great education program. So being able to participate in their, in their fair and even getting one Spanish teacher was a huge win. So we've taken advantage of that opportunity. We've also, you'll see as you shift right, we have held our own local job fairs. I think that's a first for Davie County Schools. We've had at least five local job fairs. Some of those have been completely independent at the Main Street Park, um, and some of those have been in the Walmart parking lot with the Davie Chamber. 
So we've done whatever we can do to recruit folks, particularly for those classified positions. We've had lots of help from Clay and Jenny and other directors, um, principals, assistant principals coming to help with those. Um, we've even used some $25 gift cards as incentives to share your information, come see us. Um, we've been able to hire about 30% of the folks that, we're, that we were able to see. So again, it was worth the effort. Um, that number, I think, will increase as we finish our bus classes. We had record number in our bus class in this last month and have an even higher number in the next month. So I hope that 30% grows as we hire more bus drivers as they are trained. So we're excited about that. As you continue to shift right in this honeycomb, you'll see international teaching organizations. We hadn't reached out to um, VIF or Participate or some of those groups in a long, long time, but they are also feeling the teacher shortage and said they couldn't help us unless we needed Spanish or ESL. Um, Jenny has helped tremendously with the marketing piece. We've had a big push on social media. You've seen some of that stuff on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, school messenger messages. We have been in July 4th parades. We have handed out flyers. We have decorated golf carts as buses. Um, we've driven big buses in the tractor parade. We'll throw candy. We have just really been willing to do whatever it takes. Um, We've gotten on community calendars. We've posted positions on additional job boards that we could get access to. Um, we've built a profile on um, Teach NC, which can help us recruit outside of the state. Um, and we've also really capitalized on our job fair video and tried to send that out. So lots of different things with marketing that's, that I think has been helpful. You'll also see some additional college connections there, trying to participate in some, in some other opportunities. So when job fairs are shut down, what else can we do? Can I be a guest speaker? Can I serve on a discussion panel? Can I participate in mock interviews? I will do anything. Jennifer Custer is the same way. We will do Jennifer Line led a workshop for ASU. We will do anything to get in front of your students and connect with them, and we certainly have. Um, we've made personal contacts. You'll see handwritten notes on there, um, follow-up messages, in some cases following up on LinkedIn um, or Handshake or those sorts of things, making personal phone calls, just really trying to put a personal touch. I can't offer you the highest supplement, but I can show you that Davie County Schools cares about our people and we want you to be here and it's a good place to be and we provide a culture that other places don't have. So trying to capitalize on what we do have. And then the last thing you'll see over to the far right, and you've seen this come out just recently, still trying to increase our number of subs and, our, and the activity of our subs. So we want to reward the substitutes who are subbing for us so much. We want to encourage those that aren't subbing as much to sub more, and we want to recruit additional subs. You saw on your personnel packet tonight, you have, I think, seven or eight more substitutes that you approved in that consent agenda. Um, so hopefully it is helping us to offer an incentive to say, if you will sub at least 12 days in a month, we'll give you a $100 bonus. That's a, a very small amount, an extra maybe $10 a day, um, but hopefully that, that will help a little bit. So lots of efforts there. The other thing, and I've referenced this a few times in this presentation, is really getting creative with hiring. So we have hired some retirees in part-time positions. As I said before, sometimes we're hiring two to fill one. Um, we have hired people and are looking at alternate licensing pathways. Um, folks who may be coming through a residency program or we can get them into a residency program. In some cases, we have teachers that we ask them, would you be willing to take a praxis and add a certification? We really need you to teach math if that's something that you're comfortable doing. Um, so again, getting creative with the licensing and the certifications. In some cases, we've bought some planning periods. That is not ideal, and it's not something that teachers can do long term. Um, but in a few situations, we've had to go to some folks and say, we really need you to teach an extra class. We need you to take this on if it's something that you're willing to do. Um, the next bullet on there is contracting out services. As you guys know, and you've, you've been told before, we hadn't been fully staffed and custodians at Davie High School since it opened. And when COVID hit, that, that really became an even more uphill battle. And so we had to get, again, creative. And so we ended up contracting out with Bud Services in hopes that they could attract employees a little bit better than we could with not having the benefit expenses, but maybe being able to offer a little bit higher hourly rate. So again, just get, being creative. And then the last couple of bullets are really related to teacher assistants. Um, we've had more trouble hiring teacher assistants than we have in the past. 
We do have folks that want to be a teacher assistant who don't want to drive a bus, but under the circumstances, that still has to be part of our procedures and our policy. We need them to hire a bus. But in some cases, we're able to hire a temporary tutor instead of a teacher assistant. Um, we also are able to hire some teacher assistants who might not meet the requirements with no child left behind um, and, and the education requirements with that, but we can put them through our own training program. So that's something that Ms. Lind and I have been meeting about and working with the community college and developing our own training program in hopes that we will actually end up with teacher assistants who are better prepared um, than if they just went and got an associate's degree and maybe a transfer program or something like that. So that's something that's in the works and we will continue to develop and implement this year. So that is a lot. And I hope that you're not too glazed over. Um, but I'll be glad to open up the floor for questions. And again, if it's something that I don't know off the top of my head, I'll be glad to look it up or research it or call on Clay or Jeff to help me. Any questions for Ms. Haynes? I mean, that's what I take away is uh, you're doing everything you can. So thank you for being so creative and pushing and you're a lot better than the last one we had. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that. I'm sure I won't hear that again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, ESSER report, Mr. Harris. Good evening. I'd have to say that I don't have quite as many pictures as Ms. Haynes had, but um, we'll get through it. Been a lot of conversation about COVID money coming in, spending, and um, Ms. Watts and I sat down and talked. We said, you know, let's, let's take a few minutes and talk about kind of where we are, what we've got, and how we spent the money, just so you're, you're aware of it. And then we'll talk a little bit about kind of where we're headed. So that's what tonight's all about. So we take a look at it, the, the first pot of money that I'll talk about is our CRF money. That's COVID relief funding. This is really the, I'm gonna say the initial um, pot of money that we got, it's really state driven. I'm very specific in what we could use it for. And so what I tried to give you is what we spent in FY20, what we spent in 21 last year, kind of where we are right now through August 31st. Um, as, so you see total expenses, what our allotment was, what we were eligible for, and then what balance is left. So when you take a look at that, um, there's money left in, in a couple places, and it's really slated for um, devices for K2. We, we, we've got a need um, in that area for our iPads, so there's some iPads that will be purchased with that. Um, EC support as we take a look at that, and PPE, personal protective equipment. Um, inside of that are bottle filling stations that we can put in our schools so that students can get back and, and be able to, to get water because water fountains will still be turned off, but they will be able to use bottle filling stations. And so we're looking at that, so that'll be something that um, is slated for this year um, to exhaust that money. So if you take a look at it, that money expires December 31st of 2022. No, I'm sorry, I got the wrong date. Yeah, no, this is 21. So 2021 is when it expires. Sorry, I put the wrong date in there. So we have till the end of December to use that money, uh, and we've got a plan to get there um, and use that, use that up. The next set of money is uh, state supplemental uh, money. So 154, that was the what the state gave us money. That expired on 6:30, um, and so we we used that money up. Uh, and in 20, 630 of 20. So that was what really got us through March to June of what we needed. Um, and then you get into the last two, 169 and 170. That's supplemental support for instruction. Um, and that expires 930 of 22. So when you take a look at that, um, what we've got left is really around contract work and, and what we're gonna use for that. There's a little bit that we'll use um, for nursing support. Um, we have a, uh, a nurse's aide, so to speak, at the high school that's helping us. So that's funding for that position. And then the, the 170 is around um, really tutoring. It's, it's answering to at-risk students. And so we'll use that in our, in our tutoring as we build the tutoring program out. 
Any questions? Okay. The third pot of money is, is our biggest pot of money. And this, that's what we call ESSER money. This is ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ESSER 3. They expire in September 30th of 22, September 30th of 23, and September 30th of 24. And so when you take a look at that, you, you'll see large, large pockets of money, very, very specific in what we can use the money for. So we have to be very careful in, in kind of what we do and, and how we spend that money and, and where we spend it to be in compliance with the federal government. Um, this money will be audited. So we will have to answer for how we spend it. Did we get the proper um, bids for before we spent the money? Did we use it the way it was supposed to? When we built the budget, did we match what we said we were gonna spend the money for? So anything that we change, we've gotta go in and it's gotta be approved before we go and change that, before we change where we're spending that money. Questions? Okay. So we take a look at it. Um, for ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, which were the last two buckets of money that, that expired in 23 and 24, we had to build a plan for that. And what I wanted to show here is, is kind of how we built the budget and why we placed the money and where we placed it. So 58% of the money we said was going to be directly related to learning loss, so right at 60%. Facilities is 24%. Technology was 13%. Transportation is 2%, and then I left 3% unbudgeted in case we get some, uh, some costs that, that are higher than what we anticipated, whatever the case may be. So let me talk a little bit about learning loss, what, it, what that is. Learning loss is really around software to support, I was make sure I don't miss anything, software to support student growth, assessment and progress monitoring, um, and salaries for um, teachers that come in and, and work with us in our tutoring program. Um, it, it's a, for staff development to, to teach them to teach in the new world, so to speak. Um, but as we've touched on with the last two presenters, we have positions that we want to hire in, with this money to be able to do it. We, we, we're personnel limited and the availability is just not there. And so we continue to look. I mean, uh, Ms. Haynes talked a little bit about um, grant funded positions. That's what she's talking about. We have positions that we want to fund out of this ESSER money, but we can't get people to come in. Math is a, a prime example to, of kind of where we want to go and where we need to work through that. Um, facilities. Facilities is a K building. We talk about K building, that learning center and what we need to do with that. There's work um, to, to work with, to work through that and, and get it ready for the virtual school to go there, our um, student services to go in there, that type of work. So that's part of that. Uh, as well as ionization. Last board meeting we talked about the ionization bars and we approved that. That's inside that facilities piece as well. Technology. We have aging technology in some of our buildings, and it doesn't meet what we need with some of our classrooms, um, such as our smart boards. I think I don't have Butch here, but I think our smart boards are 13, 14 years old, and they're starting to fail. So we're not able to meet the needs of what we've got, to, what we need to do to teach. So that's inside of that. Transportation is around our buses and and making sure we can meet the. Um, uh, requirements for distancing, social distancing, as well as being able to put cameras on some of these buses that don't have, so that we can do contract tracing um, as we work through that and, and really become security. So that's what makes those different buckets up as we, when we take a look at that. Questions as we went in, the, as we talk about that. So the last few slides, few slides are the same categories that we talk about when we talk about quarterly spending. So I just put them in those same buckets so we can kind of take and talk through that. Um, so overall, all of them together, we spent about 38% of the money related to salaries. We've spent about 45% of the money related to school operations. So school operation, you say, what is that? That's what it takes to run schools. So that is student devices when we need to go to one-to-one. -to -one. That's um, uh, um, uh, furniture, so we, we've introduced new, new people, furniture for them to be able to work in those situations. Um, staff computers to get us up ready to go uh, last year and this year with our virtual school and uh, being able to work through that. Software and supplies, that's, that's really what makes up our, our school operations. Contract services is, is, is in there, $146,000. We contracted with a psychologist 
to meet our social emotional learning um, to be able to do that because we couldn't hire, hire one, so we contracted that work out. Um, professional services as we take a look at things that we need. So um, we've got audiologists that we contract with. We've got speech therapists we contract with. And then people transportation, that's a part of what we need to do. We contract that service out um, to be able to get students to school that may not be able to ride our yellow buses. So that's, that's a piece of what's inside that, that contract services. Okay. So then I just took a look at and same category. I'll breeze through this pretty quickly. With CRF, they're all pretty standard in kind of where we take a look, contract services and school operations. So that money that we got that was state related, that's where we spent it. School operations there is really around computers, staff and uh, student devices. Um, the staff, I mean the state supplemental, when we take a look at that, again, school operations is a big part of where, where we spent the money, some salaries from that perspective. And then when you take a look at ESSER, um, again, salaries, school operations, that, that's where we spend uh, most of that money. Most of the salary associated with that is teacher stipends, summer school that we did over this summer. Um, that's all inside of that ESSER money. That's what paid for all of that. So that, that's the reason that salary number is so high. Questions? Questions for Mr. Harris? Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I just want to commend both of those and all of our staff, as you've been mentioned tonight. <clears throat> but one of the challenges we face is to make decisions for the immediate, but also have perpetual impact. And, and when you try to resolve issues now, but you still don't want to just go throw money at a situation now. Some we have to, PPE and things, I hope and pray we don't need that too much longer. But we also, again, the challenge is making decisions now for future, um, future need. Thank you. Uh, next item on our agenda is a public address to the board. Ms. Wilson. Thank you, Chairman Junker. Ladies and gentlemen, we're so glad to have you here and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. And I'm telling you right now, and I'm telling you as someone with terrible handwriting, I'm gonna do an okay job on your names, but probably not a great job. Please don't be offended. And feel free to correct me when you go up and say your name the right way after I butcher it, because I'm afraid I'm gonna at least on some of these. Um, so we'd like, you have five minutes and you'll see your time right in front of you. Please don't make me have to interrupt you. I hate to do that. And I know y'all can say what you need to say in five minutes. And I'm hopeful that we won't have to interrupt you at all. Uh, so remember to do that. And as, as I said, when you go up, please say your name and address just in case I've done a bad job. I'm gonna say your name and then I'm going to say the next person's name just so they can be ready and we don't have a lot of transition time because we have eight speakers, which puts us Chairman Junker over the limit uh, again. Um, I assume it is the will of the board again to continue forward. And hopefully if you don't really need the whole five minutes, feel free to take less. Um, and let me also remind you that it is the policy of the board not to respond to public comment. The point is for us to hear from you, not for you to hear from us. We deal with our things by agenda items. Uh, please be polite to each other and um, don't interrupt each other. That would also be really helpful. So here I go, and I'm so sorry. I, I, I think I've got the letters right, but I'm not positive. The first speaker is Nick Giblitis. Okay, Giblitis, I added an L. And then following will be Emery. Uh, thank you, Board. Uh, thank you all for everybody for coming tonight. Uh, and just wanted to focus today, again, a little bit on uh, com communication. And I appreciate uh, uh, Chairman Junker and uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Potts taking the time to uh, talk to me um, personally over the phone and express just communicating. And I think that's one thing that uh, uh, has, has probably needs improvement. I love to see more open dialogue. I know that sometimes it may come across sometimes ad adversarial. That I don't think anybody here has that case. We're all parents. We're all people care about our, our, our children here and all the students. Um, and so I appreciate the time. What I do um, want to stress is that, again, we are Davie County, um, and we're not 
uh, we're not Mecklenburg, we're not Forsyth County. And, uh, you know, the board, you are the board. And uh, all due respect to you, Superintendent Wallace, you're not the part of the board, you have a voice. But you have the vote and you guys represent us, as I stated last time. You represent the people that elected you here. And I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to talk out and reach out to the people out in this county. Uh, because we have a... I, I lived in Davidson uh, outside of Charlotte, I think I mentioned last time. Um, it was a very bluntly a left-leaning county. They called the People's Republic of Davidson, and it didn't it did not reflect my values. Um, and that's why my wife and I moved up here to Davy a uh, number of eight, you know, eight years ago, seven, eight years ago, because Davy is a more conservative county. It reflects our values, and I think those values are not being reflected in some of these decisions, especially around masking and guidelines. And I think that uh, key is that, again, communicate with with the people that you represent, you that uh, that you voted for. Um, reading from you know Miss Webb, your 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 flyer from your election last fall was the last bullet point was talking about op open communication was been the biggest thing in taking the tough making the tough decisions. So please do that. Um, and again, we are not Mer we're not Mecklenburg. We're not Forsyth. We're not, certainly not Maricopa, which is Phoenix, and Pima out in Arizona. My family lives in Phoenix, uh, which is a tr you know, transient illegal alien population. It is much more diverse. It's a human soup pot here. We have a very open rural area. Um, and and to, to correct you, uh, Superintendent Wallace, as we're not in the red zone. Eva, I just looked up the health and human services for North Carolina. We're as clean as clean can be. Our survival rate is the highest of any of the counties. Um, we have, you know, our, you know, we have one of the lowest transmission rates. And we actually, for all the counties, we have the lowest transmission rate right now. So please consider that in voting on this policy and on voting on what the governor brings down uh, to you as a board. I don't want to see the, the you know, uh, Mindy Cohen, uh, Mandy Cohen, whatever, you know, threatening to Union County and the two other counties that have stood up against what Cooper wants. You know, and I'm going to read, I'm going to leave it at this. I'm going to read the law that you guys, I assume, we're going to vote on later later on. And this is the law that is, is, uh, that was put in place uh, um, August 31st. And this is around part 10, local face covering policies. Section 10 for the 2021-2022 school year, all public school units shall adopt a policy regarding the use of face coverings by employees and students. The governing body of the public school unit shall vote at least once a month on whether face covering policy should be modified. It doesn't say, and that's, that's it, that is the whole part of it. It doesn't say we require masks or we're making them optional. It's telling you to make a policy, what you have. So, but again, it's not telling anybody to do anything. It's just a saying, make a policy. So they, I think, again, represent what, what Davie County is all about. You have, last time you had 100% of the people out here, certainly against the, you know, mandatory face coverings in the school. And, uh, you know, that's with that, I appreciate your time and thank you very much. Thank you. Emery will be next and then Tanya Kerr or Carr. You can say it both ways. Good evening, everyone. I'm Emery Gavitas of 217 Van Zandt Road. I'm here to address social emotional learning, which I heard discussed by a gentleman representing the YMCA in last month's board meeting. I want to ensure that you know this. Social emotional learning is simply critical race theory with a new name. It has been sneakily rebranded and renamed to make it more palatable and acceptable. Critical race theory and social emotional learning are two sides of the same coin. Both wrongly assume that certain races are unable to succeed in our society without intervention from the government, which is racism, is also untrue. Just look at how many minorities in America have achieved success. Barack Obama, Oprah Winfrey, Ben Carson, and Kamala Harris, to name a few. These insidious practices pit children in our schools against each other as the oppressor and the oppressed, teaching children to hate the color of their own skin while assuming that certain races cannot succeed in life. This is utter nonsense. One reason it is dangerous is because it encourages children to not think outside the box, to not think for themselves. People being able to think for themselves is an important life skill, which is one that formed the backbone of America. Without it, children could become unable to think for themselves and will potentially believe lies that are represented as truth. Parents are the ones designed by God to teach values, attitudes, and morals to their children. This is not the school's job. The school should be teaching academic skills, not establishing a certain mindset. 
Moral training is the parent's duty. In addition, Article 4 of the U.S. Constitution gives us our right to privacy, and this is an obvious violation of that right, especially if schools aren't notifying parents about this instruction, data collection, etc. With social emotional learning, students' information is gathered, stored in a database, and in the case that it doesn't fit the predetermined standards, it can result in bullying and discrimination. This is even worse for children who come from households where their parents don't give them adequate love and discipline. School may be their only hope of feeling loved and respected. This will negatively affect them far beyond their school lives. This must stop, as it will only lead to division and strife among students. I am extremely alarmed that social-emotional learning fuses equality with equity. Equality means treating people the same. Equity means treating supposedly aggrieved persons better than others based on their skin color, race, nationality, gender, etc. This is obviously racist and unconstitutional. Probably the best-known part of the Declaration of Independence says, all men are created equal. There is still time to help the students of Davie County, whom I know you care about very much. I hope you take my speech into consideration and then do your own research as I have. Remember, the Lord puts you into positions of power, so use your power wisely. The students of Davie County are counting on you. I believe if you listen to the Lord's voice, he will guide you well in life. Most of all, I pray that the Lord who rules over all will give you discernment to make right decisions. God bless you all. Goodbye. Next is Tanya Carr or Kerr, and then followed by Joanne, I think it's Launchy? Landry. Land, Landry. Oh, got it. Okay, that's not a C. Okay. Chairman Junker, board members, Mr. Wallace and staff, my name is Tanya Carr. I'll, I'll accept either one. I'll, I'll answer <laughs> to either one. Um, my address is 187 Woodburn Place, Advance. Um, this is my 25th year of teaching here in Davie County Schools, and most of that time has been at North Davie Middle, and I'm proud to be an educator in Davie County Schools, and I have loved my job every single minute. Um, I'm here tonight to thank you, to uh, express my appreciation to you, board members, and to you, Mr. Wallace, for your um, upholding of the mask mandate for students and for staff. I know that this decision was not an easy one to make, and I know that you have faced fierce opposition. Um, and um, I know that opposition has cited everything from this being a political move to causing depression in students. So I am also president of our North Carolina Association of Educators chapter here in Davie County. And I can tell you that in education, there are times when you have to be political. Um, we have to be involved in politics to fight for resources for our students, for our staff members. We're entering our third year, and we've talked a lot of money tonight, but we're entering our third year with no state budget, no funding for those no school counselors who are desperately needed to help our students with mental health issues, no funding for teacher positions as our students sit in overcrowded crowded classrooms, 35 in my eighth grade class, 37 in some seventh grade classes at North Davy. Um, no funding for the, the increases in teacher pay as we sit with our frozen salaries. Um, you know, so there are times for that. There are times for political action. We have to press our General Assembly to, to make the right choices, to make decisions for our, for our students and for, for our schools. Um, but, you know, that's a political move, to press our General Assembly to, press, to pass a fair budget. Um, this decision for masking is a safety move. It is um, a, requiring our students to wear a mask is a safety move to keep us all safe and um, to protect everybody involved. Last year was really, really difficult. Um, parents shared with me that their students struggled. They were struggling with depression, struggling with anxiety as they tried to navigate Canvas and their emotions without that daily support of teachers and friends around them. And this year, those students are back in classrooms. We're uh, together, and it's wonderful to return to our routines. It's wonderful to be able to see each other. But what's keeping us in class, what's keeping us in those classrooms, is the wearing of masks, that we're having them every day, and we're there together every day. This school year is even more difficult and more taxing for teachers. We are, we are struggling, working hard to educate our students while facing TikTok challenges and keeping quarantine students up to date with assignments. And as Mrs. Haynes, thank you for sharing that information, we're covering those classes when we don't have enough substitutes. So it, it's tough this year. 
Um, a, a year ago this month, my husband suffered a stroke. And he's recovering, but, you know, every day I go home and I'm worried that I'm going to take COVID home to him. And that would be a really difficult battle for him. So it's frightening that our students are suffering through COVID um, actual cases this year. Um, that's scary, but that mask manda mandate eases our minds a bit. So thank you. Thank you for putting safety first, standing firm on mask wearing, and your leadership and support mean the world to us as a staff and to the students in your care. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carr. Next is Joanne Landry, followed by David Watterson, I believe. Okay, um, I take this as being recorded, so real quickly I'm going to talk to the parents who may be watching this online when they go back to see it. Parenting, uh, the homeschool has increased in 19%. North Carolina, if you take the average from the websites I looked at, they spend about $9,377 per student. That ties into two, uh, teachers, pensions, funds, retirement, all that kind of stuff in the school budget. They get $14.41 billion annually. Uh, and they lost 2,639,953 because of homeschooling students. Also, parents, if you're watching this online, go to www.edfirstnc.org. There is a schoolhouse shock program. It's called the Whistleblower, uh, Whistleblower Program, and it fights against racially inflammatory and sexualized curriculum uh, children that are being immersed in all over the state of North Carolina. North Carolina is the largest school system in the United States with 2,695 public schools, 1,553,334 students. Also, Mark Robinson, our lieutenant government, uh, governor has facts to expose indoctrination in classrooms. We need to teach our children how to think and not what to think. Okay, subject number three. Davie County got over 6,400,906 in ESSERS. There was a conversation about ESSERS, but let's just talk about what the government the federal government dictates how you use it and how it will be used. And if they really cared about kids and teachers' lives, I'll get to that in a minute. You'd know what they would spend it on. Uh, UDRA, or UDRA Vig uh, Vigilance is the European Re VAERS reporting system. The, their VAERS reporting system in Europe, the Vigilance, says that there's been 26,041 deaths from the COVID vaccination. 2,448,362 injuries. Other European countries have validated this number. To date, Pfizer has had 12,362 12, deaths, 1,054,741 injuries, Moderna 6,907, 3,490 injuries, AstraZeneca has 5,468 deaths with 1,008,000 351 injuries. Johnson & Johnson has 1,304 deaths with 78,774 injuries. The government of Slovenia has suspended the Janssen vaccine due to the death of a 20-year-old. France had a 15-year-old who was blinded and a woman uh, within days of taking the vaccine. A woman, a young woman who died seven days after taking the shot. In Ukraine, a 19-year-old died on the same day after their religious family told him not to get it. They had um, religious me meanings, but he died the exact same day. In Greece, a 15-year-old died three days after the Pfizer shot. In Italy, a 14-year-old guy died, a girl died one month after receiving the shot. If you haven't heard, attorney Rents has proof that the Department of Defense, has, or D DOD has shown, documented, and stamped on their own department letterhead, 60% of those hospitalized patients are fully vaccinated, proving that natural herd immunity is superior to the vaccine. Israel is 90% complete vaccinated. Hospitalized majority are the people who are in the hospital are the majority ones have been vaccinated. Iceland, 80% of their population took the first shot. 75% have taken the second shot. Their chief etymologist says that it's, imp the, it's impossible to obtain collective immunity through vaccination. In the UK, 59% are doubly vaccinated, and Andrew Pollan of Oxford Vaccine Group, before their parliament, like our Congress, said that the um, collective immunity through vaccine is a myth. So if you board members want to trust the science, let me give you another little piece of information. Nigeria sued Pfizer for $7 billion for illegally testing on kids. Pfizer lost $486 million on Celebrex, and Merrick settled a $4.85 billion in Vioxx claims. Also, GlaxoSmithKline uh, had a $3 billion lawsuit for, for fraud. So my question to you is, why not just spend the $6,400,906 that the federal government has given 
instead making the right choice and saving everybody. In Davie County, there's 42,570 people that live in Davie County according to the last census. That is about $151.47 per person. Ivermectin, which sells for $1.50 a pill, or hydrochloroquine for $0.37 cents up to $1.20 a pill, could be handed out, and that would do away with all the mask and the vaccine stuff. Now, the reason why I'm bringing all this vaccine stuff is because Strong Schools North Carolina Public Health Toolkit. It's funny that the CDC should mention in your, your Department of Health meeting, Mr. Wallace, the two Arizona counties that happened, I know, only because of the election fraud, but you know, they're doing the, the forensic stuff. But anyway, here, if the CDC has um, recommended that this thing be put in through to the North Carolina schools. The North Carolina school uh, public health toolkit was updated July 21st to align to the CDC guidelines or guidance for COVID-19 prevention in K through 12 Ms. schools. Landry, your time is up. If you'll, you've, you're welcome to submit the rest of your comments online if you'd like to or by email to the superintendent. Okay. I just say instead of pushing for vaccines, which is your next goal, spend the money wisely and get rid of the masks. Our next speaker is David Watterson, followed by Charles Claiborne. Members of the board, fellow parents, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I come to you before you board to express my gratitude to you. Um, let me rewind for a second. My name is David Watterson. My wife and I have two daughters that attend Shady Grove Elementary School. Our oldest daughter graduated from Davie County High School last year and is now attending as a freshman the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. The board in late July made a decision to make masks optional for on-campus activities. And at the time, that was a reasonable decision. There could be reasonable debate about that, but it was a reasonable decision. Unfortunately, Mr. Carroll's comments on the impact of the Delta variant proved quite prescient. On August 16th, I mailed a letter to board members and leadership of the school district in which I expressed some concerns regarding the changing circumstances around the COVID, um, around the COVID pandemic but specifically within Davie County. Specifically, this letter cited the, the higher average per day case rate of 14 cases, over 14 cases in 2021 versus merely four in 2020. This letter also cited the empirical evidence of the efficacy of mask usage and the benefits thereof, who masks benefit. It also expressed, um, it also de provided, detailed the experience of districts that did not have mask mandates, specifically the school one of the school districts in Morrisville. It did acknowledge parental rights concerns, and I share those with you as well. But I also understand the safety of our children and the ability, ability of our children to be on campus in those settings is critically important. I express gratitude to this board because several days later, the board and the superintendent and the school district made the decision to go ahead and require masks. That decision was incredibly responsive. That decision was incredibly wise. That decision was incredibly agile and required leadership and introspection that is uncommon. Today, as the board is about to vote on this matter again, as required by the state, I do not bring doom and gloom, although statistics do state that we are still not in the most positive circumstance in which we could be. Our average daily case counts for the past two weeks of mature data from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services says that Davie County has 32 new cases per day by date of specimen collection. However, despite these dire statistics countywide, went back and counted. In Shady Grove Elementary, we've received about a half dozen notices for students that have had the coronavirus. I think the statistics that Mr. Wallace put up before regarding the incidence of outbreaks per 100 schools speaks to the efficacy of this practice, despite it, not being, despite it being one that none of us really do want. I would quibble with a comment that was made earlier. I do think there is a light at the end of the tunnel. The FDA should have the first round of, of the, the first vaccines for children in front of it for emergency use authorization. And I understand there are concerns with vaccine usage. 
Um, I, I can't speak to that. But what I will say is that I do see a light at the end of the tunnel. And the strength, the discipline, the focus, the leadership, and the solidarity shown by this board, by this district, and by this county, as everyone has navigated these, these unforeseen times and unprecedented times, is admirable and can further convinces me that we chose the right place to call home. Those are the end of my comments. Thank you very much, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you, for your leadership, and for your communication. Thank you, Mr. Claiborne. Our next speaker is Laura Hilario, and she will be, and she'll be followed by Pete Hilario. I'll be real quick. I promise. I just. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Claiborne is next. I thought that was Mr. Claiborne, and I thanked him. And you haven't even gone yet. I'm so sorry. My name is Charles Claiborne. I was here last month talking. I live in Coolamy, North Carolina. Um, and it, it's funny because you brought up the DH, DHHS thing this morning about that, but did you know on Monday uh, the Secretary of Education, Cardona, talked to in front of the um, Congress and was asked pretty much the same question and he brought up that same very statement about a school in Wisconsin, I believe it was. And the lady who was the senior author of that study at Wisconsin refuted him on his own Twitter account, in fact. Um, whether he's deleted it off his Twitter account or not, I don't know. But he said a Wisconsin study found that schools required masking had a 37% lower incident of COVID-19 than the surrounding community, Cardo claimed on Twitter. Later that day, it caught the attention of Tracy Beth Hogue, an ophthalmologist and physician resident at the University of California, Davis, who worked on the study cited by Cardona. She said, I was the senior author of the study, Hogue replied. Our study is not able to give any information about the role mass played in the observed low in school transmission rates. We had no control group, and so we don't know if the rate would have been different without mass. Then I'll bring up the... Uh, the EUA, the uh, authorization for masks. Under the EUA's authorization for masks, it says that masks should be concluded, the criteria and the authorization of are met, the scoop of face masks in accordance with the CDC Rex's message described at the scope of authorization and pursuant to the conditions of authorizations of this letter. In it, it says source control refers to the use of a face mask or cloth face covering over the mouth or nose to contain that individual's respiratory secretions to help prevent transmission from infected individuals who may or may not have symptoms of COVID-19. Scope of authorization. I have concluded pursuant to section 564D1 of the act that the scope of this authorization is limited to the use of face masks, including cloth face coverings, as a source control for use by members of the general public, as well as HCP and healthcare settings to cover their noses and mouth in accordance with CDC recommendations. So therefore, I don't know how we can go into requiring face masks when even under the FDA's own thing, it says it's only used, supposed to be used as a source control. And then it got me really curious to start getting and looking into it because I came across the study that was done by Dr. Anthony Fossey in 2008 along with 30 other scientists, where in this study it played a predominant role of bacterial pneumonia as a cause in pandemic influenza implications for pandemic influenza preparedness. The background of the study was basically for the 1819-1818 pandemic influenza. In this case study, he basically said that um, the majority of deaths in the 1819 influenza pandemic likely resulted directly from secondary bacterial pneumonia caused by common upper respiratory tract bacteria. I mean, so that got me into looking. So when you start looking up into the different pneumonias and everything, I found a guy came across the study that was done in France. And in that study in France, while they, the direct study wasn't that of mass, it found that 20% of all COVID patients coming into the hospitals actually have pre-pneumonia prior to coming into the hospital. 
I mean, you compare that to the study that Dr. Fossey wrote in 2008, which is actually in a medical journal. Um, has a medical number somewhere, a journal, no ID number somewhere. Uh, volume 198, issue 7, 1 October 2008, pages 962 to 970. Um, so you look at that and then you look at what that study says and it's like how can we sit there and continue to push mass on kids when we don't even know if they're effective or ineffective. You know, you look at HIV. HIV has killed 36 million people worldwide in 40 years. It currently affects somewhere around 39 million people in this world. We don't have a suitable vaccine for it, yet 40 years? And then somehow magically we get COVID and now, you know, they've linked COVID, influenza, and pneumonia all together when you look into it. How is it that you can have a disease like HIV that's killed 36 million people worldwide, but yet we haven't stopped kids from having sex? In fact, 171,000 teenage pregnancies were reported in 2018. That's not, that's only live births. That's not counting the over half a million abortions done in the U.S. during that same year. Mr. Claiborne, your time is up. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Laura Hilario, followed by Pete Hilario. Okay. As I was saying, mine will be quick, so I won't need five minutes. Um, I'm just going to play a quick, I won't play the video, but so you can hear it. This is um, from Dr. Sherry Tenpenny. Um, she's been in the field since the 80s, and I just felt everyone should hear what she has to say. Everybody has to know, and I'm sure that some of you are listening to this have heard me say this before, but it bears repeating, because what we are dealing with, Maureen, is absolutely the smartest virus ever. <laughs> smartest virus ever created. It can count the number of people in a room. It knows that, that if there's less than four, you're safe. If it's more than 10, oh man, you're, you're really in trouble. If you're in a nursing home, it can tell that there's more than two people at a time in the room. It can count. It can tell the difference between talking and singing. It can tell the difference between if you're standing up, you're dangerous and you better put on a mask. But if you're sitting here down here, everything's cool. You can take off the mask and the virus will leave you alone. It can measure distance. It knows how far apart six feet is. It comes out of your mouth. It goes poof right down to the floor, six feet away. Just absolutely, like come out, boof, right down. It can tell distance, it can tell height, it can tell time. It knows if it's after 10 o'clock, if it's before 10 o'clock at night, everything's cool, <laughs> go to a restaurant, do whatever. After 10 o'clock at night, do, 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 do. it's gonna come out and pounce on you because it can tell time. It can tell if you're eating, like on an airplane. If you're eating, you can pull the mask down, you're just fine. If you're not, you better pull it up because it's not safe. It can tell the type of building you're in. I mean, if you're in a Home Depot, it's cool, not a problem. If you're in church, uh-uh, uh-uh, it's not, it's not, it's going to pounce on you and get you. It can tell if you're talking or you're singing, because if you're in church and you're talking, it's okay, but if you're in church and you're singing, you're as good as dead. It can tell the difference between a wind instrument and a drum. If you're playing a drum, it's all cool, but if you're playing a wind instrument, you're probably going to die or kill somebody. Mm. It can tell the difference between being an anarchist group or a church group. It can tell, and now the most important thing that it can do, besides, te it can, besides telling time, counting the number of people, telling distance, telling height, it's now learned how to read a calendar. Oh. It knows that effective this date, everything is safe moving forward. All the COVID stuff can go away. No mask, no distancing, no tracing, <clears throat> no anything on this date. Because, but the day before, it's the last chance it's got to pounce on you and probably kill you. Right. And I hope that everybody gets how ridiculous it is. And sometimes when you add a little humor to the elements of what you're talking about, people see how absolutely ridiculous it is that we have to wear a mask, seven masks, and we have to wear gloves and have a touchless thing. I mean, your, your new credit cards, I mean, everything is tapped so you don't touch. And they have, um, you go into a restaurant and you've got, um, you've got menus that nobody can touch or that they can wipe them off or they just crinkle them up and throw them away because you just might spread something. I mean, if people really see how absolutely absurd and, and they make it up, they change the rules all along the way. And so all of the people that say it's all about the science, it's like, show me the science, there is none. I have her resume if anybody would like it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hilario. Our last speaker tonight is Pete Hilario. 
I'm Pete Hilario. Uh, I live in Advent. Excuse the voice. Here to talk about critical race theory, social emotional learning, which that fine young man did earlier this evening. So, in a paper from uh, Greg Childress, dated October 1st, 2021, the Johnston County School Board of Education unanimously approved revisions to the district's Code of Ethics policy Friday intended to prevent elements of critical race theory from being taught in K through 12 schools. Under the revisions, teachers could be disciplined or fired if they undermine the nation's foundational documents or fail to recognize or present all people who contributed to the American society as reformists, innovators, and heroes of our culture. There's a $7.9 million in school funding hinging on these revisions. The Johnson County's Board of Commissioners is currently withholding the board's funding request until it adopts a policy banning CRT. Review House Bill 324 for more information. Christopher Rufo of City Journal wrote an op ed and expose on Wake County Public School Systems Teachers Conference with sessions on whiteness, microaggressions, racial mapping, and disrupting texts, encouraging educators to form equity teams in schools and push the new party line, anti-racism. Rufo, with the help of Dylan, reported that more than 200 North Carolina public school teachers were subjected to what amounts to brainwashing. The first session included whiteness in educational spaces. School administrators provided, they were provided two handouts, norms of whiteness, the documents claim that white cultural values include denial, fear, blame, control, punishment, scarcity, and one-dimensional thinking. Wake County Conference formed the basis for the North Carolina Department of Instructions, or the NCDPI, New Culturally Responsible, Responsive Teaching, CRT Teaching System, rolled out to teachers statewide. The NCDPI offered two CRT courses. It is the first comprehensive statewide rollout and appears to coincide with the impending rollout of the new critical race theory based social studies curriculum. Sloan Rackmith wrote, the North Carolina Board of Education as well as its prominent member, most prominent member, reportedly received money from an organization tied to China to combat structural racism within the education system. A month after passing a statewide critical race theory policy, this foreign entity paid at least one North Carolina public school district $90,000 to create and then analyze student surveys that collect sensitive information. This summer, the North Carolina Board of Education member James Ford and the North Carolina Board of Education itself was reportedly awarded part of a $1.4 million grant from Switzerland-based Oak Foundation to combat structural racism within the education system in North Carolina. Retraining teachers to educate through an equity and culturally responsive lens. Transforming students and families into activists against the systemic racism. Just one month before the announcement, the State Board of Education released a draft of an equity resolution that parroted exactly what the plan of Oak Foundation sought to fund. The new, fund, new policy proposed and acknowledged, North Carolina schools are systemically racist, race and gender are a determinant of equity, and equity lens will be the new policy and practice for every school district and will be achieved through social and emotional learning programs. Parents in the community are responsible for achieving equity for all students. An equity officer was needed to work with the superintendent of public instruction to ensure new policies and practices are implemented and followed. Lastly, schools must be renamed if students are offended by its current name. Oak Foundation's foreign control of North Carolina's school system is being carried out by groups like Durham-based Education Justice Alliance, who train student activists to campaign against all school discipline policies and against allowing school resource officers on campus. The foundation's enmeshment in North Carolina's public education system should alarm everyone. Foreign policy group Capital Research reports that Oak Foundation founder and its directors are heavily invested 
with the Chinese Communist government in a development project called the Belt Road Initiative, where they stand to gain billions of dollars. Stop. Thank you. That concludes our speakers for tonight. Thank you very much to everyone taking the time to be here and to speak to us. Uh, before we adjourn, I do want to point out, because I heard a couple of comments, but uh, the face covering policy, 4231502172263 was part of our consent uh, agenda in which we voted 7-0 uh, to continue with that until next month. So with that, uh, I'll call for a motion to adjourn. Chairman Junker, do we need to amend a previous motion about Mr. Wallace's increase to include an effective date? It's effective for the uh, beginning July 1. Uh, it's effective for this contract year. Thank you. I, I believe that was true, but I didn't know if it needed to be stated. Gotcha. Now I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'd like to make a couple of comments beforehand. Um, I was absent last month. Um, I had COVID. Um, and I did watch the meeting online. And um, as it has been mentioned, I very much appreciate uh, all of you coming here and voicing your opinions. Uh, but something that keeps was said last month and was also said this month in, um, during public comments. The same thing came up and I just, I just want to make sure that the audience or that the public understands the reasoning for the mask. This has absolutely nothing to do and I feel fairly certain if you would poll this board this has nothing to do with whether or not a mask works or does not work. What this has to do with, we as a board need to make a decision on what enables our students to have the best chance of staying in the classroom. The North Carolina Health and Human Services has mandated these quarantine regulations. We are required to do that. My son, I, I'm going to speak, my son, due to myself having quarantine, my parents have, or having quarantine, having COVID, my parents having COVID, and I don't want to come across like I'm trying to be argumentative because that's not it at all. I, I, I truly believe the importance of being open and honest with what you all are feeling, but also where we're coming from. My son is in 10th grade at Davie High School. He was in quarantine for three weeks, over three weeks. Trust me, I have been there. He never tested positive. We sat in our house. My husband never tested positive. I tested positive. But he, like many of your students, many of your children had to endure the quarantine. Did I like it? No, I hated it. I absolutely hated it. But I want you all to understand state level health and human services are the ones who are, are putting us in this position. So there, I'm, I'm not going to, I can't do that. I, I apologize. And I probably am going to regret doing this because maybe I just, I shouldn't. But I just felt led to try and explain that. This has absolutely nothing to do with mask versus mask work, mask don't work. We have to do, we all can, I think we all can sit here and say we remember last year was so unfortunate for our students to be stuck at home, to be stuck in front of a computer, to be stuck in family settings where there probably was not an adult present to help them. We have to look out for children who may not have a parent 
like many of us, because we are engaged, who may not have a parent who is advocating for them and who is trying to help them get an education. And being in school is the, one of the best things we can do. So I apologize if you don't agree with us. I'm, I'm not, I don't love it either. But that is, that is just where we are. And so I, I apologize for, for taking that. But like I said, I, I, watched, I watched last month on, online and I listened tonight. I hear your frustration, but I did, I did feel like it was my responsibility to, to say that. So thank you all for coming. I really do appreciate it. And I, I understand we're, we're, we're going to disagree on things. But thank you. Motion to adjourn. I have a motion by Mr. Drexler. Do I have a second? I have a second by Ms. Smith. All those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Yes, money. Decide. Change the future. Next time when you come up here, have some documents.